Oh my goodness, okay. Hey folks, oh, thanks for your patience. I've been having some uh, technical mishaps. Just give me a couple of minutes to get things kind of sorted out. Um, I'll be right with you. Thank you for your patience. I really appreciate it. Um, you might've just heard my chihuahua being very demanding in the background, kind of his jam. Um, Okay, let's see. Did we work out the capture? Yeah, I think we're good on that front. I just need to, um, yeah. And I was just gonna do a really quick uh, intro plug to mention talk with Lex and then. Great, that's awesome. I'll drop out. Coolio. Um, we are super, okay. Crystal, da, da, da. Hey, Sarah, is that you at 206, et cetera? Uh, that's me. Hey, Sarah. Um, just can you hear me? Know, I can hear you great. Can everyone out, can people raise their hand if they can, they can hear? Both of us, great. Um, in, I think, a way that is super on brand and gives us lots of street cred, Sarah, who is currently in Seattle and was gonna um, Zoom in with us from her office, is calling in because she had various weird technological cop-related malfunctions on the way to her office. So <laughs> there were like 40 cops lined up on the block behind my office and like I had to sneak in a special back way <laughs> through the loading dock. And then weirdly, none of the Wi-Fi networks in my building seem to be working at all. <laughs> right. right. They, I don't think they actually give a shit about what we're doing, but I mean, I'm fully a conspiracy theorist. Bring it on. Um, I, okay, Me. I need to admit a few more people into this. I think we're uh, gonna get started pretty soon. Just give it a couple more minutes. Hey, um, if folks can make sure that they um, keep their um, audio um, muted for now, um, that would also be helpful. Thanks so much again. If you're just logging on, hi, hi. Um, there's also, um, we had a little bit of a technical issue uh. um, with some of our captioning. So for folks who um, might need to utilize captioning, we just got a chat um, link. There's a link in the, uh, in the chat screen to another screen where you can like check out the captions. We're also planning to like incorporate these and have them um, ready to go in a full video after the fact. But technology is our friend and confidant. So there we are. Um, let's see. I think we've got just about everybody who signed up is here. So I'm gonna give it like one more minute and then we're gonna get started. Uh, and Naima, just so you know, so I'm just, streaming the zoom window awesome great perfect um, and that's how it's working so just cool. whatever the zoom sees the public sees the public my great public y'all y'all have no idea what it took for me to not wear a cocktail dress to this um i have not <laughs> <laughs> i was like no one see me except for my mom and my dog for like two months <laughs> <So> <laughs> like okay I'll put my art in the background and you know put on a shirt um oh man okay so it looks like we've got um a critical mass so let's go ahead and get started All right. let um, me I'm starting the stream we are going live to the public let me check 
check. Woo! There's like a 10 second delay between. Cool. Oh, and there it comes. Now we're getting everything. Great. So, okay, I'm letting you. Okay, we're looping. Ah! <laughs> Okay. Okay. You might have to yeah. mute yourself so you don't lose your mind. Um, uh, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and OK number one, and then we can, we can get going? Oh my god. This is driving me crazy. Yeah, I can't. OK. OK. Hello? Yeah, we're here. OK, sorry. You I just, I just I, got I wanna... trapped in an infinite audio loop. Of, uh... I understand. Are we, are we good? Are we good I... to go? I think I just restarted it. Um, channel is offline, channel is offline. It takes like 10 seconds. Okay. Hi, folks, again. Um, thanks for your patience. A little bit of technical difficulty. We're trying to be super fancy I'm with the Zoom and the Twitch again. and the all the things. So, <laughs> uh, what's going on? Lucas, can we can we start? Okay, um, I'm actually gonna Lucas. Can we start? <laughs> uh, no, sorry, I'm still having I'm having a infinite sound loop problems. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, is it possible for you to figure them out in the background as I'm starting with the people who paid? Uh, can we just wait a few minutes? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, audio output capture. Let's try this. Um, I just want to make. Yeah. Um, okay. 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 Let's try this, and I'll figure the rest out. Cool. Thank you, Lucas. I appreciate it. Um, so do you want to just say the quick thing about OK number one and then I can uh, get started? Yes. Oh, God damn it. Um, I'm getting the loop again. Let me just, you just go because I can't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, everyone, for being here. Technology is fantastic. Ghost in the machine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm Naima Lowe. Uh, you are online here with me, with my great friend, um, Sarah Lippick, who is on the phone with us, uh, thanks to various technological and civil disobedience reasons. Um, we're here to talk with you about um, our experiences with uh, lawyering and the law and uh, resources for artists. Um, just a quick uh, note on kind of process, how we're gonna be going through. We're gonna be kind of talking at you, giving you some basic kind of ideas and information for the first chunk of this time. And um, my uh, friend Lydia, um, who is online here as Q&A moderator, um, is gonna be available to keep track of any questions that you have and feel free to put, a, put them in as we're going. Okay, we're probably not gonna be able to address like everything, but Lydia's job is to kind of like call things, pay attention, et cetera, and then let me know when we get to the Q&A section um, what we can kind of come back. I think that's just easier and more humane than trying to do the like popcorn with 15 people in a Zoom, yes? Um, so, um, and I encourage you to do ask those questions and uh, you know, we'll do our best to engage with them. Um, we also, as I said, have um, captioning service. There's a link sent to you through the chat um, for where you can log in for that. And so we appreciate that. And also particularly appreciate folks donating and um, paying for this so that we could afford to do the captions. Um, our intrepid uh, producer supporter, Lucas, who is trying to get the stream for the free part of this, um, is offline or off screen at the moment but runs an incredible space here in Tulsa, Oklahoma called OK Number One that is focused on events of creativity and artistry and engagement with the greater Tulsa um, artistic community. And we're really fortunate to have his support for this project. Um, 
Okay, dive right in. So um, I, I'll just introduce myself again, Naima Lowe. I'm an artist, a writer. Um, I am based in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, where I have a residency fellowship here, where I'm just sort of plugging away at all various things. It's a piece of my art in the background here. Um, and I got really excited about the prospect of being able to share information about what it might take and require um, to access legal resources and what are the things that might get in the way of being able to do that um, as artists. I just became really, really kind of emboldened and excited about the prospect of being able to share that because I realized that we are so often encouraged to think of ourselves as kind of disempowered and only allowed to sort of be grateful and only allowed to sort of take whatever scraps are given to us, right, by all sorts of larger systems in our world. Um, and that includes within our sort of work as artists. And it's, I decided I wanted to do this because I've had more than one experience of sort of putting myself into the position of saying, yeah, I'm really grateful for this opportunity, for the chance to show this work, to have this grant, to have this residency, to work for this university, but something's not going right and getting a lot of sort of pushback, frankly, until I got a lawyer involved. Um, and I just think it's important um, to remember that there's value and, and, and uh, legitimacy to standing up for ourselves as artists and as workers and as people who are invested in the ongoing sort of practice of change that, that I think we're all invested in. Um, so let's see, where else is in my notes? Uh, you know, part of what I put, um, I think the actual note that I put, I'll read it aloud, is, let's see, our gigs can be great, offering resources, visibility, and platforms, all things that artists need. But we're also expected to suck it up if we're treated poorly and get, and can sometimes get concerned about being viewed as ungrateful or difficult, right? Um, I say this is a false dichotomy. It is possible to be grateful and humble without having to eat shit. Um, that's where our good friend Sarah Lippitt comes in. Um, so Sarah, do you wanna introduce yourself and maybe say a little bit about kind of how it is that you came to become the lawyer that you are today? Sure, of course. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Sarah Lippick. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to show you my face because of technical stuff, but I can hear everything that's going on and um, I think we'll make it. Anyway, um, yeah, so I'm an attorney. I uh, kind of came to the profession a little later on in life. I was in my late 30s by the time I graduated from law school. I think I was 37, yeah. So anyway, prior to becoming a lawyer, I had a long career in um, kind of the harm reduction movement and community organizing type work. So I ran uh, needle exchanges and did like street-based HIV testing and worked primarily with homeless folks, um, with trans sex workers, um, and with a bunch of different multiply marginalized populations, as they say. Um, so that work was great and it was really exciting and fantastic to like, you know, co-organize and co-lead things with people who are most directly affected by the, by the AIDS epidemic and by the, you know, the work that we we're trying to do. So I really believe in, you know, kind of non-hierarchical and liberationist uh, organizational structures. But as I kind of moved up in that world and my work was more and more like running programs and um, getting grants and apportioning resources, for one thing that wasn't the way I wanted to do things. I wanted to do, you know, face-to-face -face client service. I wanted to work with people. And um, also I realized there was a, that I was kind of, you know, being shunted into a position as a gatekeeper, which is kind of what you get promoted into, whether you like it or not. If you're good at direct service, you know, your reward is to get taken out of direct service and put into management where your job becomes much less loyal to the to the person you're serving and much more um, about loyalty to the organization and that means kind of rationing services it means you know picking who gets what 
and um, kind of horse trading with other organizations. Like if you do a referral for someone, you want to make sure that they're going to, you know, not mess it up so that other referrals you do in the future go well. So I guess what kind of bothered me was one, that kind of gatekeeping is always going to be informed by your implicit and explicit biases. And also outside of all of those, you know, kind of justice issues, it's also just kind of like there are people who are easier to talk to and easier to work with, those people are often um, the recipients of the lion's share of services. And so part of my wanting to become an attorney was that I wanted to be kind of a full-throated advocate and actually work for my client and be an advocate for my client and, um, you know, have them set the direction that they want to go and, uh, you know, use all my tools to, to to meet their their goals instead of kind of having a divided loyalty between the person I'm working with and the organization I'm working for. So that's part of it. And the other part of it was that, you know, I went a lot of times, you know, we did a lot of advocacy. We changed a lot of laws, um, especially in New York. Um, I was involved with a campaign to get <clears throat> Narcan, which is, a you know, um, an overdose reversal drug uh, listed as a first aid drug so everyone can use it. Um, I worked on the campaign to get syringes uh, sellable in drugstores instead of just um, through medical and syringe exchanges um, and in and a lot of other things worked on getting fe the federal ban on um, needle exchange funding to be lifted. And so through that, I kind of you know, spent a lot of time, you know, going to city council and city hall in New York and the state legislature and uh, even, you know, the national Congress um, and testifying and, you know, meeting with legislators, uh, with groups of people, mostly groups of drug users and some other service providers. And, um, you know, frequently we would kind of see that, like, by the time we were able to talk to someone, the deal had already been done. And there'd been a meeting before the meeting where the legislators would talk to other people, not us, and <laughs> the decisions would get made. And, and the other people they were talking to, um, a lot of them were lawyers. <laughs> and I realized also that a lot of the people I was working with had uh, legal issues and that there was a dearth of people who could, who were both able and willing to, you know, work with folks and provide legal support. So I kind of decided, you know, someone from our side <laughs> has to do this. So I ended up going to law school. Um, and so I've been practicing for, um, let's see, about seven years now. And uh, I've done a number of different things. I've done some criminal defense. I've done a lot of civil litigation. Um, I've done a lot of stuff involving constitutional rights, uh, a lot of stuff involving bad cops, um, and a lot of uh, discrimination lawsuits and uh, stuff based on, you know, racism or, um, you know, people people getting discriminated against because of disability. So that's kind of what I do now. I work for a small firm. I do mostly education law, but I have had kind of broad experience and just because of my own uh, inclinations and social life and the people that I know, I have ended up working a lot with artists. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I'd say that's a good foray into how we met. So to give a very, 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 condensed overview of the issue that, you know, uh, made it so that I, you know, needed a lawyer for the first time a few years ago. I was um, a member of the faculty teaching art and video at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, um, for, until the end of 2017, from, yeah, 2010, 2017, and to make a very long, very racist story, story short, um, a group of students, um, had an uprising in the spring of 2017 at the campus about systemic racism, about campus police violence, about dis lack of disability services, about, you know, all, all the things, right? The things that we know are kind of happening. And those, as those students kind of rose up, um, the campus, you know, they overtook administration buildings, they shut down, um, you know, parts of the campus. It was pretty incredible. And one of the things that um, they also did was um, 
tar not target, they sort of paid attention to a particular uh, evolutionary biologist whose name I refuse to say ever in public, um, who made the sort of situation entirely about himself and his like very injured white person feelings and um, went on Fox News among other very right wing sources and basically got us all, anybody who was involved, including faculty like myself and other staff, particularly staff and faculty of color um, and students of color, um, really specifically black students and faculty um, who had been sort of supporting this uprising basically got us doxxed um, and had, and you know, essentially like put targets on our backs, right? Because he was on Joe Rogan, he was on Fox News, he was on these like total alt-right sites, he was tweeting, tweeting it was awful. Um, and as that was going on, you know, my life kind of imploded. Um, the, there was the, the campus was evacuated because of active shooter threats. I had no sort of safety or protections from the from campus authorities. Um, and um, then those two people <laughs> sued the state of, like, well, those two people, sorry, this man and his wife um, sued the state of Washington and the Evergreen State College for racism against them as white people. Um, and a lot of their case involved me essentially stating that basically because I was like mean to them or like that I said, hey, you're being racist in various public forums um, that and that the college didn't immediately like censure and fire me that therefore like, I don't know. So yeah, their case was like Naima's mean. And so I was going to get to pose. It was like all a mess. And so then I had to find a lawyer. And up until that point, I was really hesitant. I had people sort of suggesting that to me. And I don't know if this is something that any of y'all are familiar with. It was certainly my experience. I was like, and what, I, I am a black woman. I live in the world. In what universe are legal proceedings going to do anything but fuck me up? Right, like I was prepared, I was very, and you know, I was also depressed having my life threatened daily by trolls. I wasn't in the best state of mind, but I also just couldn't sort of conceive of, of what I needed to do. But then I sort of put out information into my networks that I was going to need some support in initially around this deposition. And that was how I, you know, sort of by kind of asking a lot of people and finding this connection that I connected with, um, with Sarah, who, uh, helped me really both think about the potential for this deposition and also the potential that like I had also been <laughs> injured by the institution. It was really, really, an, and we're going to talk in more detail about this, but it was really the, the big takeaway that I remember having this kind of like light bulb that went on that Sarah kind of described to me, I think early on in a moment of trying to sort of prepare for a potential deposition was like the lawyer's for the Evergreen State College and for the state of Washington, as uh, along with any of their representatives, their job, as Sarah talked about before, is to protect the institution, right? They need, they're there to protect the institution and I'm here to protect you. I'm here to advocate for you. And it was a really important distinction to make. This isn't about whether I liked anybody who I worked with. <laughs> this wasn't about, you know, feelings and all that kind of stuff. This was like, at a certain point, those gatekeepers become about the institution and not about the people. And it becomes valuable to make it clear that you have support and advocacy. And for me, that was incredibly helpful, both the mindset change and just like logistically and legally to have someone who is like, I'm on your team, I work for you, right? <laughs> like this is, this is how this works. Um, and that I think is one of the one of the reasons why we think it's good for artists to think ahead of time about what they're going to do if they find themselves in a situation where they do need legal help or even one where even if they don't need legal help, they might just, you know, they're, they're, there's often just an advantage to be gained, you know, a better position to be gained by having some advice. And so, because so often people are dealing with institutions that have more power than they do, um, you know, and artists are so often put in the position of supplicant, you know, and undervalued, and they're also underorganized as a field of labor and underrepresented as a field of labor, um, that those are some of the things that brought us to the idea of having this workshop so that, um, you know, you can just be in a better negotiating position as you deal with institutions, as you deal with uh, collectors, as you deal with, um, you know, all kinds of situations where someone else has gotten a ton of advice from a lawyer and uh, you could 
you know, benefit from the same kind of thing, or you could, you know, kind of be exploited by, by the situation. Exactly. And, you know, for me, it was so critical because to sort of keep that in mind as I've gone through all manner of different sort of, you know, the majority of my interactions and experiences with institutions that I work with are, are positive. They're good. We work well. I do my work. They do theirs. It's fine. But when it doesn't, I think that there's sometimes, in addition to this, like, be grateful attitude, I personally have had the experience of people approaching me as if I, with the, if, with the assumption either that I, you know, all gratitude all the time, hey, little black girl, we did this for you kind of attitude, right? And also an assumption that I am too dumb, too resource, under-resourced, um, and, you know, only care about kind of making nice. And I just, you know, this is a, a me thing. I don't necessarily think that everyone has, has to have as big a mouth as I do. However, I think that it does benefit all of us to remember that we are, what Sarah just said about how under unionized and under organized we are as, and, and why, and that other artistic, and I'm talking specifically from my personal vantage point as like a visual artist, you know, where we're dealing with sort of like the collector world and the museums and the residencies and all these kind of like big moneyed institutions, all this philanthropy, all of it completely unregulated, right? As opposed to some of our peers in say film and television or in uh, theater who have big ass unions, right? You can't do things in Los Angeles without the Teamsters. And that means something in a way that it doesn't for us. And I think that because we're in that situation, I'm not saying we all need to, you know, unions have their own challenges, whatever. The point is like, that is a reality of our labor. And I don't know at what point we sort of decided collectively as artists to capitulate this idea that like, what we do is just like this like weird privileged pet of the rich as opposed to that we are doing work of our culture and our communities and we deserve to be respected. Uh, that's, that's the world I come from, so here we go. Um, so we wanted to kind of foray into just sort of some overview of some of the big picture issues that come into kind of art lawyering um, and where having a lawyer, where knowing some stuff about resources and possibilities might come in handy. And for folks who just sort of joined us, I just wanna remind you that um, we, the way we're dealing with Q&A that's gonna come later in the session is we're just asking folks to like type questions if you have them into the chat and our Q&A moderator will kind of collect them. Um, and we'll do our best to kind of address them at the end of the session. Um, but um, Sarah, I will hand it over to you to talk about these sort of big picture issues where sort of having an outside general mindset of it's okay for us to stand up for ourselves. Um, what are other sort of like, sort of big, what are other sort of areas of legality where, um, or er situations where having lawyers or um, understanding legal systems would be useful from your perspective? Sure. So uh, some of the, the, the big categories would kind of be like intellectual property, um, contracts, and employment law, as well as kind of business law. So intellectual property is, you know, copyright protecting your work. Um, it is also licensing, you know, how do you, if you are going to let someone else use your image or publish your book, um, you know, how do you handle those kinds of negotiations. Um, you know, I've had a lot of friends and clients who've, you know, discovered that there's an Etsy shop where their drawing that they had on their Instagram is being printed on coffee cups and sold or used as a textile pattern and sold. Um, so those are some of the kinds of things that come up. Um, and then also just, you know, how do you, especially for writers, um, but also illustrators, other, other artists, you know, sometimes uh, visual artists who are working, for example, at a day job as a graphic designer or an animator. Um, oh, sometimes you, you're going to be ha working in a day job where, uh, for instance, Disney is famous for uh, making or trying to make their animators sign contracts saying that Disney owns everything they draw for the entire time period that 
the the employees work for Disney. So including, you know, the doodle you made next to the phone or the portraits you made of, you know, your cousin's kid or whatever, Disney claims they own all of those things. So how to negotiate maintaining the rights and when you want to sell the rights um, for your for your work, that all kind of falls under intellectual property um, and and copyright sometimes and then um, the other big thing is one of the big things is, is contract law so this is basically almost any time you have to sign your signature on a piece of paper <laughs> that is very likely contract law so this includes things like when you're agreeing with a gallery to sell your work and what are the terms and conditions for the sales of your work. Um, what kind of liability is there when you do your giant installation and you have people helping you and they're up on ladders, um, you know, and, and, and you're at an institution. And that would also include contracts for like, you know, creating uh, public artworks. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll be hired by a city or something like that to, to produce something or hired whatever by a theater to make set design. So um, contracts and can also include uh, sales contracts. So it can include agreements you have with, um, with buyers, with collectors, um, with museums that are buying work from you. Um, you know, sometimes when a collector or a museum buys work, they are also buying the rights to reproduce that work. And if you don't mean to sell those things, then that's, uh, that's a contract negotiation. Uh, if you just want to sell the object and not the, the rights to use the image, then that's a contract negotiation. Um, if you're being given the privilege slash obligation of, of a residency or a fellowship, um, that's a contract negotiation. And that kind of, you know, the, the, it bleeds into employment law. So frequently, um, you know, artists aren't, artists are in positions where they're treated like employees. And there's a, kind of like what I was saying about, about a fellowships or residencies where you're, you know, you're expected to be somewhere, you're expected to maybe even keep office hours, you're expected to uh, give classes or give lectures or give open studio tours, things like that. Um, you're expected to do a whole bunch of things that look like job duties, but most institutions that are giving out fellowships and residencies are not, are trying not to consider the artists and their programs as employees. So they're trying to consider them as uh, independent contractors. So that's definitely a contract negotiation issue, but it's also potentially an employment law issue because a lot of institutions are wrongly hiring people and having them act like employees and then trying to call them independent tr contractors so that they don't um, have the same kinds of rights that employees do. So um, all kinds of situations that are like a job. Sorry? Can I just pause you right there? I just want to like reiterate mm -hmm. that point and just get that really clear is that that in itself, framing people who are employees as contractors is potentially in and of itself a problem, <laughs> right? When you are in fact working um, and, 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 and being expected to respond um, as an employee, even though you are not and thus aren't protected. And, and I just want to reiterate the way that that is on purpose um, to both be able to exploit our labor and our intellectual property and not protect us. And yeah, I'm just, I, that was like a flashpoint of like, aha, in the last like couple of years for me that, you know, hasn't stopped me from trying to like engage with the opportunities that I have because the world is what it is, but understanding that distinction and that it's not a given that I just have to put up with that versus that there are people with big institutional resources making a decision to frame us in that way. And that potentially us making other decisions about how we engage with that and respond to it is also something that we could do. Sorry, Sarah. Um, no, 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 no. Um, so those are kind of the broad stroke. Oh, and also, you know, what you, business law, which also kind of covers, you know, or, or shades into a number of things that I've already kind of mentioned, but, you know, 
art making making art and using it to make your living whether you're selling paintings or books or sculptures or teaching or uh you know selling your expertise in some other fashion that's you know that art making is your business so business law encompasses things like you know when do you want to make like an llc for example when is that more advantageous to be an organization rather than an individual when you're doing um um, contract work, or um, is it ever a good idea to have a nonprofit or to have a 501c3 nonprofit that is like an umbrella for you when you're doing uh, publicly oriented or public service type projects? Um, so, yeah, so business formation, nonprofit formation, taxes, 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 um, things like that, business licensing. When do you need to have a business license to be able to sell work or be engaged to do work? Um, those kinds of things, that kind of business law is also a big category of uh, things that artists should pay attention to and need a lawyer for. Um, in addition, of course, there's all the stuff that just happens in life. You know, uh, artists are people and people get arrested and people get sued and people, you know, have domestic violence situations and have to get restraining orders and people have disputes with their neighbors. Um, so there's that whole range of other things that aren't necessarily directly related to being an artist, but are things that artists are subject to like everyone else and that um, make it handy <laughs> to have to have some idea of how to contact a lawyer within your circle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and for the the sake of time that when we sort of organized this 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 workshop we opted to kind of give this overview i have a sort of resource sheet that sarah put together for us that i'm going to send to everyone that kind of gives some information about these different areas and ways that you can kind of dig in more deeply and certainly again if there's like specific questions in some of these areas that you have please do ask them there's no way for us to kind of you know in a our session would be like here is everything to know about art related law but you know wanted to give a kind of overview answer some questions but put a significant amount of our time and energy also into this this thing that i personally find daunting but want to support people in maybe finding less so um is the how right like this was some of the why and i'm sure a lot of you we could go on and on about where else the why could kind of come into the um to the picture um but there's also the how which again can be i think could be more um challenging than it seems at, at first glance and for me personally when i got to the point of feeling more clear and empowered about what some of that um the how looked like I've been able to approach a variety of situations with a much more clear sense of what I expect um, from the people I work with. Um, one of the big lessons that I've learned recently and wish I'd sort of like kept more in mind over the last couple of years is that like if someone approaches you about a contract situation and says there's no negotiation um, and the contract is like 30 pages long or short for that matter, um, that's a red flag should pay attention to that, right? You're, you're being expected to kind of get shoved into a corner. And that is something that I wish I had sort of thought about more clearly um, in, in various situations. And I just really want to encourage- and, 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 Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just going to say, like, just as a rule of thumb, if you're being asked to sign something, that's a situation in which you're being asked to make a contractual relationship. And if that is a significant contractual relationship, if it's for a year long residency, if it's for, you know, doing doing teaching for a length of time, if it, you know, is a significant contract, then that is the trigger for a 
for, for legal advice. It's a reason to get legal advice. And what Naeem is saying is, is something I would also like to emphasize, which is that if you're being asked to sign something, that's a contract. And by uh, the, the general principles of contract law include kind of a necessity to fair dealing. So most states have that encoded in their law that in, in, in a contract negotiation situation, everybody's obligated to do their best to engage in fair dealing. And one of the things that means is that there can't be like an insurmountable uh, power or information inequity between the two parties, which means that if someone's ever trying to tell you that you just have to sign and you can't have a lawyer look at it, then that by itself is usually considered a violation of, uh, of a and the, that would potentially invalidate contracts that you sign under those circumstances. So if you're being pressured to sign something like right now and you're given an hour or a day to look at it, then I would always advise to proceed with caution, to ask for a week to review the paperwork and to uh, talk to a lawyer in that time. I would also say that, you know, I, I mean, Sarah, you can answer the question of whether this is actually potentially falls into this fair dealing situation. I've encountered the, the scenario where in the attempt to engage and negotiate the ways that people have responded to me was, well, I mean, I guess, I mean, to, to, to things that I have earned right, to contracts, to prizes, to residencies, et cetera, that I've earned, to when I say, there's something about this contract that seems a little bit challenging, and the response is, well, you can either suck it up or just do it. I don't know whether or not that actually goes into fair dealing, but I would, I feel like I can personally say that I think that that's in pretty bad faith, and that speaks to an entity seeking to like maintain a power relationship with you. Now you could still, I'm not saying therefore don't engage, but it's like, for me, it's been like, these are flags that I wish I had looked at before in a different way <laughs> um, in terms of how I'm being, it is, it is telling to me the differences that happen around people who are very open to engaging around these things versus where it is a shut case and we're being sort of asked to, I'm being asked to just kind of take whatever I can get. Um, as far as the expectations and as far as contracts that actually have any sort of protections or engagement around my expectations of the institution, right? That's another big one. It's like if your contract doesn't, is only about the, the institution's expectations of you and not about what you can expect from them, we are workers, <laughs> right? Like we are workers. This isn't like, I'm not going on vacation when I go into the studio, right? I'm working. And so I ex can, it is appropriate for me to expect that there are, there's clarity and parity around how I am treated contractually and otherwise. Um, yeah. And yes, it is part of fair dealing that everybody has the chance to review the contract and everyone has the chance to review it with legal counsel. So you, anytime you're told you need to sign something and there's no negotiating, you know, like ask for a week, um, I would I would recommend. And and yes, um, yes, that to answer your question, Nana, that does <laughs> definitely go to, to to fair dealing. Everybody's supposed to have time to review the contract. Mm -hmm. um, so now we'll get more into it. I think it's a good foray into the question of the how. Um, so as I sort of indicated a little bit when I um, uh, talked about my experience with Evergreen and, you know, I want to reiterate that like in that case, I was in a dire situation. I was in a very emotionally fraught situation. And in reality, that might be the case, right? When you're, when you get to the point where you're saying, I might need a lawyer, <laughs> it might be that you're in a sort of like emotionally compromised as well as legally compromised position. And in some ways that's a really hard place to make decisions from. Um, but in my case, and I didn't know what I was doing and I was confused and I was ready to be like, you know, all cops and all lawyers are bastards, et cetera. I love you, Sarah, but you know, that was where I went initially, right? And then I, but I did tap my networks. I, it's not an accident that I got connected to somebody who has this 
kind of connection to harm reduction and to, you know, because those are the people that I know. And those are the networks of people who deal with legal issues that I had exposure to. And when I put out the call and, and got the sort of information flowing, it was, and, you know, and I talked to different people. I, ha, you know, I basically interviewed different people and had kind of, you know, the experience of like, maybe that would be okay, but I'm not sure. Um, and it turned out to be not only useful and, and I'm happy that I kind of tapped my personal networks first, both in terms of like the types of um, kind of sensibilities about the world that were important to me, um, but that I was in terms of like politics, right? It was also that like, it mattered to me how I was gonna be treated, right? How I was gonna be interacting with someone as a like freaked out black woman getting her life threatened, <laughs> right? And trying to figure out what to do. It made a difference that, you know, I was ultimately working with somebody who had experience with dealing with freaked out black people, <laughs> right? At what both in her legal profession and in the world, because, you know, I could be heard and I could ask questions and I could try to understand and I could be respected, um, which is what you want out of any professional relationship where you're, you know, paying someone money um, to help you with something. And so, um, so that was like first and foremost, um, you know, tap my networks, ask a lot of questions. Um, I, you know, it was important to me to be ready and I've learned this sometimes the hard way that it, it can take a while, right, to kind of like, find a fit. I had somebody sort of random, I don't think they were trolling, they just like, I don't think they were actually interested in the workshop, but respond to the question of how when to lawyer up. And their response was three years before the thing happens. And I was like, fair. <laughs> like, that's legit. Um, that's not always possible, right? We don't all sort of have, like, you know, a giant law firm that's on the board of our organization on retainer, right? The way a lot of the entities that we work with do. Um, we are the workers in this case, but it can be useful to kind of know where to go and then where, if you want to establish those relationships, you know, um, Sarah now knows that I won't abuse this privilege, but once in a while she'll get <laughs> off for me very early in the morning <laughs> because some shit is happening, um, right? And so in addition to, you know, working with people who are actually in, you know, whatever place or in whatever area of law that I need support with. Um, so, so what are, what just, are some of the, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, oh, I was just going to piggyback for a second on Naima's uh, statement about reaching out to your social circle. And like, if you're anything like me, like I didn't hang out with a whole bunch of lawyers before I went to law school. I actually still don't hang out with a whole bunch of lawyers, just a select few. So like when you're thinking about reaching out to your social circle, don't uh, necessarily think that that means, you know, you have to already know someone who's a lawyer um, because the chances are pretty good. You've probably, you probably know somebody who, you know, they aren't a lawyer, but they've had to hire a lawyer and they've had a good or a bad experience, either which can be like educational and, you know, useful for you. So I, reach out to your friends, even if you don't know any lawyers and even if you don't think your friends know any lawyers, um, you know, someone probably knows a lawyer or has had to hire one or can tell you, you know, don't go with this firm. They were terrible. Um, so, yes. So, I, you know, I would always start with that and I would kind of do the same sorts of things you would do when you're thinking about a therapist, right? Like you want to try to find someone, you know, who uh, ideally you could get someone who's, you know, has a recommendation from someone that you trust. And so going to the, to the, to the social circles first, and we'll talk a little bit more in a second about, um, you know, the process of kind of interviewing and choosing lawyer um and i'll get back to the metaphor about about therapists but um some of the other places that you might find leads on a lawyer aside from asking around your social circle which is awesome but not everybody you know not everybody's social circle is going to turn up a connection um, here are some other places that you can look um, if you have a university in your area then uh 
talk to the law school there. If you look at um, the bios of the professors in the law school, you will often find someone who is either directly interested in writing about the issue that you're confronting. So maybe it's First Amendment and free speech stuff, um, which is actually another legal thing that lawyers sometimes face off <laughs> about. Um, or maybe it's maybe it's immigration, and you know you can find an immigration lawyer who is a professor and that person usually is not going to practice themselves but they're going to be if they're you know a good law professor they're going to be in touch with people in the field they're going to know lawyers they're going to be able to give you at least three or four names of people that you can call so look in the law school directory look in the professor's bios and try to find people who are interested in the thing that you are interested in the other thing i would look at is uh, most law schools have what's clinical education section so those are places where there's a there's a, a law professor who does practice as a lawyer and who supervises law students and does it's usually volunteer stuff so it can be you know working with with um, people who've experienced domestic violence or it could be working with immigration um, there's lots of different types of clinics but the law professors who teach clinics are generally very well connected because they need volunteer attorneys to uh, help supervise their law students so they'll know a lot of people so again look at the law school directory find who's doing a clinic uh, a clinical education program and then talk to them and they're generally pretty helpful you can just you know cold call or cold email and you know ask for a few minutes of their time on the phone or in person um, similarly bar associations so the bar association just to be you know super basic and make sure everyone knows the terminology um, bar associations are like the licensing bodies for lawyers so they monitor whether you pass the bar exam and they handle lawyer misconduct and things like that so in almost every state and in almost every county there will be a bar association but they're not just the licensing body they're also kind of a, a guild or like not quite a union but like a guild for the profession. So most bar associations will have a pro bono coordinator and that person helps coordinate like volunteer lawyers for various different purposes. That person is almost always also very well connected. So if you look at your local bar association and there will be a state one and a county one and um, some cities also have bar associations. Uh, most of them will have a pro bono coordinator or a pro bono program of some kind and you can again cold call, ask them, ask to speak to whoever does the pro bono coordination for your bar association and then ask that person who they know that does the type of law that you do. And as a bonus round, that person will probably also have a lot of ideas about, um, you know, different organizations where you might be able to get legal aid, uh, you know, discounted or free from a, from a 501c3 or from an organization. So the pro bono coordinator at your bar association is another big resource. And then of course there's legal aid organizations. So people that are doing legal work or volunteer legal services. Um, there's a growing number of people who do uh, what's called low bono. Pro bono just means free and low bono is a kind of a new phenomenon where it's like kind of sliding scale for lower middle in income people and a lot of artists fall into that category. <laughs> so you might also look for legal aid organizations that work on an issue similar to yours or a different issue. Um, in the list that Naeem is going to give out, I included a number of uh, legal aid associations specifically geared towards artists. And the biggest one is there's a kind of a national umbrella organization with many local chapters called Lawyers for the Arts. So it'll be like California Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts or Washington Lawyers for the Arts. So by using that as a search phrase for your you can find your local chapter and I also put the, the national directory of lawyers for the arts chapters in that handout so you can you can talk to them. Those are also uh, usually it's uh, groups of volunteer attorneys who do kind of consultation and uh, recommendations. So often it'll be like if you just need to talk to a lawyer for an hour or two, you know, that's often Tool. you might still need to like engage someone but they can also help you find the people who are practicing that type of law so you'll often find like you know intellectual property lawyers and and um they're familiar with other aspects of arts law uh, at those volunteer associations 
Um, I would also look at other nonprofits. Um, even if it's not a legal aid nonprofit, like if what you're going through has to do with, you know, um, a discrimination issue uh, that has to do with disability, for example, then I would look for disability related organizations, disability advocacy organizations, and call them because the chances are pretty good that even if they're not a legal organization, they, um, if they're doing political advocacy or even if they're doing direct service, they will probably know some lawyers that are working on those issues. Issues. So finding just a nonprofit and calling them up and, uh, you know, calling up a program manager or even an executive director and asking them um, what lawyers they work with on those issues can be useful. Um, and when you're really at all those things and not found anyone, um, recently working with someone in a situation where the organization that they were having trouble with was like such a huge force in the town they were in that it was difficult finding a lawyer willing to work on, you know, in opposition to that organization. And in that case, one of the things we did, which wasn't what ended up bearing fruit, but it could be, <laughs> is to look at past court records to find who has sued that organization before. Because if there's someone around in the town who is doing that work, then you can find out who it is by looking online at, um, for federal lawsuits, it's a system called PACER, and you just look at like federal courts, if you just Google kind of like federal courts records, and there's a fee, it's kind of like, you know, 10 cents a page-ish, but, you know, on the, there's a document called a notice of appearance, you can see who the attorneys are, well, actually any document will have the attorney signature, but if you look at the notice of appearance, it'll tell you definitely who is the lawyer and or the team of lawyers representing um, whoever is suing an organization. Um, any other ideas, Diana? That's I think that's pretty um, much what we yeah, have. So, yeah, those are the big ones. I mean, I want to reiterate the value of the um, of the the law professor route, um, the law school route, and other sort of clinic and aid routes because. You know, for, for good reason, I think it can feel daunting. You're sort of like, okay, can I find somebody who has that kind of like advocacy mindset, right? Not, there are plenty of lawyers who don't <laughs> have that mindset around what they're doing and you trying to like wade through, you know, the employment lawyers who their whole practice is like protecting organizations against little guys like you. And you're like, how do I find the difference? I don't understand. <laughs> like, this is overwhelming. It's useful to find entities where even if that person that you call the, you know, law professor isn't the person who's supporting you, that person, because they're teaching law is like the odds of them being in a kind of like social service, public service kind of mindset, and thus also potentially have like educated various people in the, the city or state that you're in who have a similar kind of inclination is is high right and that can help sort of create leads and also give you an opportunity to kind of think through some of the issues um i mean i think your your metaphor about uh the the, the therapist is apt i was like what do i hate more than interviewing therapists it's gonna go be interviewing lawyers it's not always fun, <laughs> right? Like there's a, there's a, an aspect of like, you have to kind of keep reiterating the same story. You have to find the fit. You have to, you know, ask the questions of, do you know this person, you know, just like we don't all have the like magical black woman, queer therapist that we all deserve. We don't necessarily have that lawyer either. <laughs> um, and so we're like, you have to do <laughs> some, some, some legwork to like find those connections. Um, in my experience, especially having done this more than once, it's like, it's, I've learned to kind of think of that as like an opportunity to like really get clarity on like what I'm actually doing. Do I, you know, where some of my needs are? And it's like, it's research, right? I'm trying to find those connections and it's ultimately been, you know, been a helpful process, even if in the moment, it can feel a little daunting. Um, I think, okay, I'm gonna just pause for a second. Um, oh, this is actually a really good question that I have here from our moderator that, um, that I think will lead us into the last part where we're talking about like 
the how of actually like starting off work with someone and someone was like, what kind of contract should you actually have with the lawyer, right? And what does it look like to actually be hiring someone? I think is the sort of bigger picture. Yeah, that is so, definitely one of the things we're, we're gonna cover moving forward. Um, and I guess what I would just say right off the bat is that if your lawyer doesn't have a signed, it's usually called a legal services agreement or sometimes it's called a letter of engagement and it kind of lays out the terms of your um, of your work together. And if your lawyer doesn't have that or doesn't ask for that, or if your lawyer is totally unwilling to negotiate on the terms of that, if there's anything that bothers you in it, then that is a red flag. Um, I have had several clients who came to me after they had an attorney that like literally took their money and then just didn't really answer phone calls again. And it was really hard to show what had happened because they didn't have written documents. And that's like a worst case scenario, but like, it's just a standard thing. If someone is like above board, and ethical and like is very very normal to have a letter of engagement or a legal services agreement to start so yes you should have a contract with your attorney generally what it will say it what it what it should or usually does cover will be things like what are the lawyer's duties to you there's generally a duty to like zealously pursue your interests Right. Um, so what is the lawyer's duty to you? Um, also, in many kinds of cases, especially in criminal cases, like a lawyer can't just quit. They have to, um, you know, make sure that you that it won't harm your case, that you can have enough time to get another attorney. So like they'll usually a letter of engagement will outline um, what happens if you disengage from each other. And if it's the attorney's decision, kind of how much notice you'll get, things like that. Um, most states require attorneys to provide all, like provide your file to you if you choose to move on. So that's covered in an engagement letter. Um, one of the, oh, yeah, uh, you should have definitely information about billing. So, or, so if you're, you know, if you find someone who is taking your case pro bono, it should say that for free. If you find someone who is taking your case on what's called a contingent fee basis, that means, um, you know, you're going to be in a lawsuit or negotiation and you will either win some money or not. Um, a contingent fee basis is when the lawyer only gets paid if you get money. So it's usually like a large, a, a pretty hefty uh, proportion of whatever money you get, but you don't have to put anything out ahead of time. But even if it is a contingent fee basis, you should know, like, is the lawyer at that point getting a percentage? Are they getting an hourly rate? You know, how do they track their hours? So that should be in there, financial stuff about if you are paying hourly, how often do you need to pay? Is there a deposit? Uh, what happens if you get done with a case and there's still money in the account that you've paid for a deposit? Things like that should be covered in an engagement letter. Um, I also like to include something is about kind of just laying out the terms of communication. So saying like, I do my best to answer phone calls in X time, um, emails are quicker, you know, like whatever terms there are about, about communicating. Um, there's some things about the client's duties. So it'll be things like you agree, you know, not to discuss the case without talking to me about it first you agree not to directly contact the opposing party you know and you agree to like sign papers you know ex expeditiously or quickly um so those are the kinds of things that are in, in an engagement letter but like any other contract you know it is negotiable so if you see something in someone's engagement letter that makes you feel strange or like you don't like it, um, I would ask them to explain it first. And if their explanation doesn't help you feel better about it, then you might actually want to ask someone else to take a look at it or just walk away. But yes, um, thank you for bringing that up. And um, and we, we um, I don't know if there's much more to go into. If you have more pointed questions or like more specific questions about the letter of engagement, then then go ahead and you know send a chat about it. But but uh, yes, the letter of engagement is is super important and is something that I would not advise you to hire an attorney without getting one. Yeah, and and I'll say that my experience, you know, again, there's been this really helpful difference between just like in any other kind of contractual thing when that's been clear when the people involved explain things to me well 
you know, help me understand, help me how I'm going to, you know, spend my money. Um, I'm pretty psyched and it works out well at the very least on the level of the like professional engagement that we're having, regardless of the end result. Um, and, you know, without going into like too, too much detail, you know, I've sort of started to learn and appreciate, you know, this like, the, the, the legal profession is huge. There's like a million lawyers, like they're practically a dime a dozen at this point, right? It's like an overpopulation. And lots of different lawyers doing lots of different kinds of things, working in lots of different ways, working in lots of different kinds of firms. And, you know, one of the things that I kind of experienced, like in the situation with, with Evergreen, is that, you know, when I was in a sort of a situation where it was just Sarah and I managing, you know, am I going to get to pose? I got to go to this, you know, crazy uh, uh, investigation meeting. I got to ask you about this weird letter I got, like, da, 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 those kind of things, like working with, you know, this person one-on-one, -on -one, you know, figuring out a retainer and going with it, hourly rate, all the things that Sarah's describing made the most sense. When we got to the point where, you know, so the continuation of the story at uh, Evergreen and the biologist who shall not be named um, was that, you know, so he sued, he and a very, very big wealthy law firm <laughs> sued the college and the state of Washington for racism against them as um, white people based on like Naima and some other like black 20 year olds said that they didn't like them or whatever. Um, the state settled, right? <laughs> and, you know, at a certain point, there became a question of like, can we also, you know, work within a settlement? And Sarah, you'll stop me if I go into territory I'm not allowed to talk about, right? Um, sure. the, uh, <laughs> I think I'm okay. But basically, you know, I then needed to negotiate a severance from my uh, contract and kind of get out of there and deal with it. And that was potentially a bigger situation. And we then worked with a bigger firm on contingency to kind of like make that happen. Right. And so I had no idea before I was starting that there was different possibilities like that, where there could be sort of more of this like piecemeal, you know, you know, that there's, there's situations where people are like, we're going to give you a flat fee for this entire set setup. Here's an hourly rate for this thing. Here's the percentage of the contingency that we'll take. And that's both like, you know, like I, for example, recently was like, oh, we're in COVID. I'm in 17 different um, high risk categories. Maybe I need like estate planning and a power of attorney. And the people I contacted about that, you know, who had, you know, information in the state of Oklahoma, it's just like a flat fee, right? It was like, we're going to fill the paperwork. You're going to give us this money. We'll talk it through. We'll do the thing. You know, if you're going to, you know, I was thinking at the time about doing a like, you know, insurance marriage uh, with my boyfriend. It was like, we'll get you a $500 prenup, right? Like these were things that they could just kind of play out where in other things where it's like, you got to go hourly, we got to see how things are to go and on up to, you know, big complex, you know, litigation or, or, or things like that and, and everything in between. I mean, these are just the kinds of things that I've experienced. And so it was helpful in those initial conversations to also, and about contracts, about possibilities to kind of, it's understandable if you don't know what's possible and what those things are when you're approaching it, uh, a situation. But, you know, once you do get to somebody that you're appreciating talking with, saying like, are you, you know, comfortable working with me on this basis versus this basis? Do you think that, you know, this is something we can kind of like, knock out in a few hours of, of work or is this going to be a long played out thing what does that look like and it's also been my experience that the lawyers that i've worked with who have been invested in a kind of public service you know set, setting who recognize that they're going to have individual clients that they're advocating for who don't have like a ton of money you know they're going to charge the fees they're going to charge but they're also going to in my experience they've been very helpful in telling me you know this is what you know this is what it's going to cost. And also here's ways that you can like, you know, save some money because my hourly rate is what it is. So if we can avoid, you know, you pay me that, you know, $200 an hour to like collate the email train that you had because you went ahead and did that ahead of time, right? About the situation you're in, like the lawyers that I've worked with who have been kind of engaged with me as a 
just like normal ass person and not just like set that five hundred dollar an hour clock going big old institution you know what i'm saying like um I'm and that's that's a great yeah that's a great thing to like suss out in our first meeting and i think we might be jumping a tiny bit ahead of ourselves so like let's circle back just a tiny bit and say like okay let's say you've approached your social circle and uh, a law professor and the pro bono coordinator at your bar association and legal org and you have found hopefully more than one maybe three you don't need 90 but like you know a few options of people who you might want to talk to about possibly becoming your lawyer and so um i just want to spend a couple minutes talking about like how to prepare for uh talking to someone about becoming a their lawyer and what a first meeting might be like and what kinds of questions you might want to ask is that cool naima yeah go for it okay so once you have this short list of people um, you know, we're in COVID right now, so I guess, you know, most people are going to be meeting over a video call. Um, I would recommend a video call as opposed to a phone call if you can do it because, you know, I mean, ideally in other circumstances, I would find a face-to-face -face meeting just because so communication and so much of you know understanding your rapport with someone comes from from physical cues and gestures and posture and all that stuff so i would definitely recommend trying to meet someone in person or see them at least on a video call for your first meeting so when you set up your first meeting just like um just like a letter of engagement is kind of a red flag if it's not there most good um will offer a free consultation so it's usually you know like they'll say 30 minutes um but most most attorneys will spend between 30 minutes or an hour with you the first time you meet to kind of determine whether you're good for each other and whether they want to take the case and want to hire them so what i would recommend is calling up um asking about the person's schedule, finding a time when you can meet and talk, and being prepared for that meeting before it happens. So um, hopefully whatever thing you're going through that has um, brought you to the point where you want an attorney, maybe it's something simple like, I just want you to look over this contract, or maybe it's something more involved, like I'm afraid, you know, I'm getting at, at, at a, at a um, I would recommend not talking about the situation with as many people as you can or anything like that, but like if you have a confidant, a partner, a best friend, um, you know, a family member who you talk to about big issues, I recommend telling the story to someone before you tell it to the lawyer. Um, just so that like if something's unclear or whatever, you know, someone can point it out to you and ask questions, but mostly just so that you can have done it once, at least once, so that um, whatever emotional freight you're bringing into the room, it, you know, isn't gonna spring on you. I mean, it's no harm or shame if you cry in your lawyer's meeting, it happens all the time, but like, you probably want to be able to, you know, to focus on the content of the meeting and less on what you're experiencing emotionally. So I would recommend telling the story once. I would also recommend writing down a timeline. Lawyers love this. And most of the time, it's going to be the first thing that you're asked to do if you hire them anyway. So just a chronological timeline. You know, I was hired in 2017. I worked without incident for a year. During that time, I had good employment reviews some point you know um my boss started hitting on me here's the first time i remember it happening here's the date that i emailed him and said hey please stop so it's it's great if you can sit down and just write out a timeline and it doesn't have to be you know a novel but just like what dates you can it also doesn't have to be super precise because you know usually people are not keeping the kind of records that they would keep you know because they don't know that they're about to be involved in a lawsuit. <laughs> so, you know, you might have a memory be like, ah, oh, well, you know, this happened sometime near the winter holidays. So, you know, we think it was in winter of, of 2019 or whatever. So if you don't know an exact date, that's fine. But to the best of your ability, I would write out a chronology of what has happened that has bothered you. And I would make it, um, pretty complete as in if something happened that made you feel funny at the time but you don't really know if it fits into a picture of illegality or if it's something you can do anything about put it in 
because it, you know, that's part of your lawyer's job is to evaluate what facts are useful and which ones are not. So erring on the side of inclusion is a good idea. You know, it's better to have more information and have some of it not be useful than to sit on something because you're not sure and, you know, it could have helped your case. So I would write out a chronology and it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be super detailed, but just kind of like, you know, first incident was sometime around X date. Um, if you have documents, you know, if you're involved in a dispute, let's say, you know, someone didn't pay you for a piece of work that you delivered. Um, you know, if you have receipts for the shipping, if you have emails about the communication, um, anything you've got, um, try to line that up and and have that ready for the attorney also because that's something they will also ask for you if they ask from you if you if they start working for you so it's great to have that stuff lined up it also will help you organize your narrative so that it's easier to kind of tell what happened so that's what's going to happen at your conversation with your attorney you're going to be asked to tell the story and Here's the, this is the way in which an attorney is not like a therapist. Like you don't need to tell the story, you know, with all of the, um, all of the detail and all the emotional content, because you will tell them again, you know, they're going to ask you again about the story the next time you meet, but just to figure out whether you have a case and whether it's something that they're interested in, you know, you want to develop like a short, narrative be able to tell them succinctly kind of what happened and what you think should happen and this is a big one and you might not be able you probably will not be at a position before you hire an attorney to actually make this decision and having an attorney is one of the things one of the things that they will do for you is help you make this decision but it's good if when you walk in to talk to them you have an idea of what you want out of the situation Sometimes people are, you know, they want that, you know, money is the currency that people get compensated in usually. <laughs> so, you know, a lawyer will help you manage your expectations about how much money something might or might not be worth. But if there's other things you want out of the situation, if you want your old job back, if you want, um, you know, the person to stop using your design on their website, if you want someone to, you know, give you their the back royalties that they owe you for something that you've licensed to them, you know, whatever it is that you want out of the situation, to the degree that you know what it is, um, be clear about that. And of course, you know, like I said, kind of dollar amounts and, and what sorts of things might be available is stuff that your lawyer will help you on. But if there's something other than money that you're looking for, you know, be able to articulate what that is. So you will, you'll talk to the attorney, they will ask you what happened, you'll tell them, they'll ask you what you want, hopefully, and you'll tell them, and then they will tell you if they think they can help with that. Mm -hmm. um, so and then at that point you know what you then you then you'll might have a so if if if, you, if they might want to work with you and you might want to work with them and you have a good impression then at that point you would probably just start talking about kind of the nuts and bolts and you want to ask questions like so you know what's your communication style do you prefer to talk on the phone or by email how often can i expect to hear from you um if you email me how soon do you expect me to respond um are you going to be doing a work on this case or is there someone else I'll be in contact with like a junior attorney at the firm or, or, or a paralegal? It's not always a bad thing. There's some paralegals that are like completely brilliant and know much more about the law than their bosses. So like, don't be turned off if they tell you, but they should be honest with you um, that, you know, other team members are going to be working on your case. So you want to ask things like that. You want to ask, you know, what they expect of you. You want to ask the money stuff, like do they require a deposit? Um, how soon do you have to give them the deposit? How often do you have to pay a bill? How do they track their time? And you want them to, you know, all good attorneys should be giving you, like, each month a statement. It's kind of like an hourly, minute by minute, um, usually it's six-minute increments kind of detail about how they spend their time. So it shouldn't just be like worked on case, you know, for eight hours. It should be like, you know, it'll be like, I wrote an email to opposing counsel. I did research on X issue. I drafted a memo, you know, I drafted a brief. 
I filed a motion, I went to a hearing. So, you know, it should be pretty detailed, whatever statement you're getting, a billing statement. It should be detailed and, and it's, it's conventional for it to be in six minute increments. Um, you know, you might ask, if, you know, if, if money is a concern and you're worried about not being able to afford the attorney, you should tell them. Tell them, hey, look, you know, if you think we're going to go over 500 bucks this month, I, you know, I'll need to know before you get to that point. You know, call me up and I'll decide how I want to proceed. Or if you think like, hey, I, you know, here's about what I am going to be able to expend, you know, in a month on this case do you think you can work with that or you know are you willing to work on contingent fee which we talked about so contingent fee as we as we said is you are basically the lawyers making a bet on the contingency that you will be winning the case or, or getting a settlement um so that's when a lawyer feels really good about their ability to you know get something out of the case and you want to make sure those terms are really clear before you sign off um usually it's a percentage uh what i see most often is someone in kind of 20 and 40 percent of a settlement is for fees some attorneys also put costs on top of that so if you have to pay for expert witnesses or mediators or investigators or you know forensic accountants or that um, those people would also be paid by you usually. So all that stuff should be clear um, in, a, in a letter of engagement. If something's not clear, try to clarify it. If they won't clarify it, then that's fishy. So that's if everything goes well. And I guess, Naima, you've, pro you've had a lot of experience talking to a lot of attorneys, <laughs> but maybe we can talk about some of those things that might be red flags when you meet someone for the first time, what might make you feel like, ooh, this might not be the right attorney yeah. for me. Yeah, I mean, I will, I'll, I'll say a little bit. I mean, I wanna move on to our couple of questions just because we're looking at the oh, end great. of time. Um, but I'll just, the, the one thing I would say is like, um, yeah, if you have those red flags about communication, you know, pay attention to them. And I would say that, you know, because you're dealing with a situation where somebody is working for and with you, you know, my instincts, your instincts are good. And, you know, for me, it's like, it turns out I like, I like a small business. <laughs> across the board, right? I like being able to talk directly to the people I'm actually working with, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, my experience has been better in those settings and with like, even if it's the giant firm that's doing all the things that I want, um, that, that, that's that been a better relationship for me. But honestly, even in the situation where things have been less than ideal, um, you know, being in the position where I have an understanding of, of what's what my um, expectations are has ultimately helped it kind of work out. I won't go, I, I won't, I won't labor y'all with the bad. Um, instead, I want to answer these, ask and answer co the couple of questions that we have because you're both really good. Um, thanks y'all and thanks for your patience. I'm sorry, this is going to potentially go a bit over. Um, and like I said, if you do have to go, we're recording this entire thing and so you'll have access to it um, later. Um, so the first question I have is, um, what are all, what is, what is everybody's thoughts on Title IX coordinators and or university equity and civil rights compliance offices that are employed by larger institutions? Are they reliable resources? I will answer that question first briefly and say no <laughs> to the last part. Are they reliable resources? It has nothing to do with the individual people. Right, I've, I've known people in those roles, but people that I've like gone to school with, people that I respect, people who I love. Um, but ultimately, if they work for the institution, they work for the institution. Now, sometimes those roles, those people do carve out a piece where they are trying to have some kind of independence, right? Like I worked with, there's a like compliance officer at um, Evergreen who, you know, I trusted her being very forthright and very business-like, especially compared to some of these like wacky humanities professors who just want to talk all day, having a lawyer who was like very, very straightforward about here's what the law is, here's what the expectations are, it was actually great. And so it wasn't like personal about her. I trusted her personal integrity, but ultimately um, I felt like at the end of the day, um, 
that role tended more towards protecting, or at least the, the unfortunately, the like equity offices. Now maybe stuff that are tied specifically to Title IX is maybe a little bit different, but unfortunately it's like those roles, right? The, the like, the thing, we all know the story if we've worked in like higher ed, oh no, there's racism. I know, let's do a three year search to find, you know, some very beleaguered black woman that we're gonna hire to do this work. Then we're gonna set her up so that it's actually really hard for her to do the work well, <laughs> right? And, and actually make changes and then she leaves, right? I think, I, I know I've seen that happen I think 10 times. And so it's not about like, is it well-meaning? Can those people have the right intentions? It's like, if they are, if it's a real like straightforward, you were in a like kind of, I don't know if antagonistic is the right word, but like in that kind of um, situation with the institution, the institution is ultimately gonna be trying to protect itself. And that person is working for that institution. And it's, and yeah. So th that's my take, but maybe um, it's different with Title IX stuff. <clears throat> you kind of fight it, fade it out for one second. So oh, okay. you're talking about human resources oh, okay. people yeah so it's like the question was yeah. title nine coordinators university equity and civil rights compliance officers like by yeah. like, the general question about like how reliable are they as sources of support for i'm guessing in this case somebody who is like a staff or faculty um at that institution <clears throat> so Title IX coordinators in particular have a certain um, dual loyalty, like they are, you know, they do work for the organization and, and their job is to ensure compliance with Title IX and federal regulations. So on one hand, Naeem is absolutely correct, like they do work for the institution and they are, you know, even when there's an investigation going on, it will often be you will see subtle things like just that, you know, the, um, whether a point that could go one way or the other, it will almost always go to the institution, if that makes sense. So a Title IX coordinator is um, useful in that they can, you know, they can talk to you, um, but if you're progressing in a complaint that implicates the institution, I would definitely recommend getting your own attorney. That said, um, there are many legal processes by which it is necessary, or at least extremely advantageous, and sometimes actually necessary, to have made a complaint through human resources or your Title IX, com your Title IX um, coordinator before you can go on to next steps like in mediation or in in a lawsuit so um you know i would say to be safe you get you get your attorney and then you may oh sarah you cut out for a second say that again sarah, oh i said I, what i would say is like you 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 get your attorney and then they help you make your title nine complaint ideally yeah, um but if you need to make your, your complaint ahead of time you know you, you go for it i would just say um you know be very careful about any kind of language that implicates you right. <laughs> you know right. that, that says anything about like what you what your reaction was or anything yeah. like um yeah even things like you know, I was getting headaches, you know, I would, I would be very, very um, judicious and keep your cards close to your chest as far as anything you say about your own actions or yourself, because yeah. that's all stuff that statement that you can't contradict later if you want. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Does that really make helpful. sense? Yeah, and I'll okay. just say that because you cut out a little bit there, just that like, yeah, the, the value of you might work with that Title IX officer, you might be required to in various ways, deal with investigations, but that having your own support, you know, it has been, I will say it has been useful at times for me to be like, have Sarah say to me, Naima, this is where you shut up. This is where <laughs> you don't say a word. This is, you know, like these are helpful things in terms of dealing with those processes, even in the situation where, you know, that person is maybe running an investigation. It might, you know, again, in their own good faith attempt, be trying to be helpful. I think this is where, again, this like, you know, after working at Evergreen for a long time, I had to really work hard to like dislodge some of my institutional loyalty. And that came 
that was really helpful because the institution was not loyal to me, right? And and again, that's not about any individual like did that person like me or whatever, but that institution's job is to maintain itself, right? Mine is to maintain myself. Um, so the second question that we have is for artists and self-employed folks, can you talk about protecting your finances prior to starting litigation? Is it important to start an LLC or take other financial measures to protect assets and artwork beforehand? Um, and I'm assuming that means like before like entering into like some kind of complex legal proceeding or maybe even just in general, is it useful to like protect your assets? Um, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure, but I'm assuming it has to do with like, if you're going into some kind of proceeding, what are useful things to do, you know, sort of financially to kind of protect yourself? <clears throat> um, you know, it, 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 the advice I would give kind of varies widely depending on what sort of lawsuit you're engaging in. Um, there are many types of lawsuits where your asset sets are not going to be in danger. That said, um, you know, civil litigation, there is always the possibility that the other side will win and that they will be awarded attorney's fees. So it's never impossible. It's often unlikely, but it's never impossible that a judge is going to order that you pay the other side's legal fees. Mm -hmm. um, so to that extent, your finances, you know, might be vulnerable to having to pay pay legal fees. Um, that said, there's not really, you know, without a particular situation, there's not really necessarily like a direct path from like I'm getting involved with a lawsuit, like my 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 work is going to be in jeopardy. You know, there's not a type of lawsuit where like a painting would be automatically awarded to someone else if you lose. Maybe, I mean, maybe if someone's suing because they, you know, paid, they say they paid for something and that you didn't deliver it, a, a judge might order that thing um, handed over. And in that case, like if you give the thing to an LLC or a corporation that you run, it doesn't actually protect it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, more particular than that, like I, I would say, like, in, no, you don't have to have an LLC to have a lawsuit. And you don't necessarily have, you know, vulnerable assets just because you're going to do something that might end up, you know, with a judge involved. Um, but, you know, particular situations are different. And I would definitely recommend asking your lawyer. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and that's else? been, that was the other thing I was going to say is that what I've entered, there are times when I've entered into situations where I was like, I have nothing, I'm never gonna have anything that's, you know, and then there's moments where I'm like, I just sold my house, I got a little something, what do I do? And it's been, and so I appreciate the question because it's been one of the first things I say is like, what are the, you know, what do I have to kind of like manage in this situation um, around my own assets? And it was sort of similar to what Sarah said, is like, there's an outside chance around this, you know, get, you know, legal fees, if you go as far as a lawsuit being, um, being awarded, but that it's less likely, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, um, that, and, and, and having that on a very case by case, um, seemed useful and that unfortunately some of the, I mean, does an LLC in itself, like, what is it? You know, it's called a limited liability corporation. Like, what is the limitation of liability that it is? Is it like actually protecting something in that sense? I don't. I guess I don't fully even understand its function. If it, you know, if you can't explain that all to us in five minutes, there, I understand. But <laughs> um, um, it can protect certain assets from the liability of something done in the course of the business. So, like, yeah. if you, you know, if you're driving a car for your boss. And you get in an accident, then it's the it's the company. It may, it's potentially the company's liability rather than yours personally. And that's kind of like one of the major things that companies are for. Um, that and like tax tax liability is you know to the company as opposed to the individuals. But yes, that's way more than five minutes. Um, one of the things I was <laughs> going to say um, about about legal fees and and cases in general is that you know 
it's important to remember that like upwards of 95%, you know, sometimes the cases it's like 98 or 99% of cases don't go to court. They never end up with a trial. Most cases settle in negotiations. And so, um, you know, the, 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 the types of things and, and, and attorney's fees, you know, are, are rarely allocated in a mediation. So that's why I say it's unusual. It would be unusual. Um, an unusual case where where a individual person would be ordered to pay the legal fees of an institution, um, and in mediation, it's it's almost never on the table um, for for an individual versus an institution, and the vast majority of cases settle in mediation. So that's another thing to think about when you're when you're talking to attorneys is the way mediation works in 99% of cases is called shuttle mediation, which means it's not a face-to-face -face conversation with you and the opposing party. It means that like you and your lawyer are in a room, you know, usually for a whole day eating snacks, you make the, the lawyer makes a big binder ahead of time to like, you know, talk to the mediator, um, give them the facts and the other side does the same thing. So whoever you're opposed to, um, they're also in a room with their lawyers eating snacks for like a whole day. The mediator's job and the mediator is usually an ex judge or a practicing attorney. And the mediator kind of goes back and forth, bringing offers and trying to get people's, you know, expectations closer together until you reach an agreement. Mm -hmm. So that is what most attorneys are going to need to do at some point. So when you're talking to someone and you're thinking about whether they are a good fit for you, that's usually going to be your end game. Unless you're just getting a little consultation, like I, you know, look over this contract or, you know, how do I fill out my green card form? Like if you're, if you're going to be involved in, you know, any kind of matter that involves someone else that you're opposed to, then that's the end game. What you're looking for is someone who's going to, be a strong mediator and also a good negotiator for you. So when you talk to them, you want them to be, you know, concise, you want them to be forceful, like at least, you know, able to communicate with force. You want them to like be someone that you can picture kind of, you know, advocating for your case well in a mediation situation. Um, we have one more really useful question here. Can you talk about the oh, cool. difference between arbitration and mediation? Yes. Um, mediation happens in almost every case. Arbitration usually happens because there's what's called an arbitration clause in a contract. And when you look at your contracts, like look for that, because that's an, it doesn't seem like the most meaningful, important thing, but it actually is quite important. So arbitration is like binding mediation. Mediation is a process by which two parties kind of try to reach an agreement and then they'll sign um, they, you know, if they reach an agreement, they'll sign, they'll sign a legal settlement, right? So at that point, they're bound by the settlement. Arbitration is kind of like a, a hybrid between mediation and a court proceeding. So an arbitrator is almost always um, a judge or an ex-judge. I, I mean, not a current judge. They're almost always an ex-judge. Um, and the, in that case, instead of just having a mediator who is someone who kind of runs your offers back and forth and tries to bring you closer together, the arbitrator makes a decision on the case. So it's very similar. You're both kind of, you know, you, you still have shuttle mediation. Usually you present your case, but it's more going to be focused on the arbitrator asking questions about the facts, going back and forth, seeing, you know, what people want and what, what the case is like. And and in that case, it's a lot more legal analysis and less uh, less negotiation. And the arbitrator is like a judge. The arbitrator makes a decision in the end that everyone is bound to. And it's not necessarily a compromise between two people or a settlement you would have reached otherwise. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing to know about arbitration. Sorry. I was just going to say that's a lot less frequent in these kind of situ in the type of situations that we're in than mediation, right? Mediation is much more common. Mediation is more common, but a lot of contracts have an arbitration clause in them where the institution is at least trying to govern the terms and, and get out of mediation. So the thing to know about that is that when a company um, is dictating that there's going to be arbitration, they often will name the arbitration 
firm. And so it's something to know is that like, if you're in a dispute with, you know, the phone company or a big institution, a big university or something like that, that, that goes to arbitration all the time. And that has these boilerplate contracts that all have an arbitration clause, then they're probably like the biggest customers of the arbitration firm, if that makes sense. So they're supposed to be neutral, but when you look at the arbitration record, like often you'll find like, yes, this neutral arbitrator decided for the, the company 90, five percent of the time and that's not it uncommon so um i i generally disprove disapprove of arbitration clauses and i try to take those out um and that's different than what's called a, a venue clause a venue clause is when when it says in your contract if there's a legal dispute we're going to do it in x county or x state court and that's different but arbitration clauses i generally think they are disadvantageous to the little person and advantageous to the person you know to the institution or to whoever is setting up that clause mm. so arbitration clauses are one of the things i look for and say like mm, yeah i don't like that in a contract mm -hmm. oh i had learned something today that i did not know i mean i knew that arbitration was about somebody making the decision, but the part about the, the sort of clauses and contracts, and it completely makes sense that, you know, the, the, it is in the interest of the institution to hire their own people and to, you know, and, and, and that's something I've definitely experienced of sort of like sort of vague mediation, quote unquote, con, you know, um, uh, uh, processes where everybody involved is like chosen by the institution and right. you know, like works for the same people that the institution for the same firm that's on the board and it's, you know stuff like that and like you know that's different than getting to a point where in a you know where you are actually somewhat operating as like equals in the in negotiation um and you know I think, because I don't want to go too much far over our time, that's a great place to kind of like just circle back to just this overarching point that I'm pretty keen on in terms of really how we think about ourselves as workers and, and our ability to negotiate. Like there, there's a reason that unions exist, right? And part of that is being able to do, like they are called collective bargaining agreements because you are working as a larger entity that can come to the table legally with an institution whose job is to protect itself as opposed right again i'm not trying to make the case that therefore unionization in and of itself say solves all of our problems although it solves a lot of them um but it's a great thing to kind of keep in mind about the difference between how we're about how we're sort of treated in certain contexts and what our expectations can be, right? I think it's very easy for us, especially in this particular moment, anti-union everywhere, um, you know, artists as these kind of like, you know, pet smart people of, of philanthropies, right? Like this is, go, flies in the face of what all of that work that we all benefit from um, to sort of like create protections for us as people who work and who contribute culturally, physically, economically, and otherwise um, deserve to have. And that for me, there's this combination and part of the reason I wanted to share this, why I appreciate again, all of you for coming and paying, et cetera, is that I think there's a like mindset shift that also is part of this, this phenomena that can be very individual in terms of like oh shit the thing happened call sarah early in the morning etc <laughs> but also um in terms of how we kind of think about our work um more broadly um i feel very very clear about you know maybe it's a particular i was raised by professional artists um <laughs> and my sort of sensibility about what that means and why it's valuable to think of our work as work um, was well established early, but I do need reminders and it is unfortunately often in moments of duress when that happens. Um, but I also hope that there's opportunities, you know, for us collectively in the world in these moments in time to kind of take some of the tools and energy that we often bring as artists to 
the movements that are around us to think about our own labor and its value as well. Um, so I think that's where I'm going to kind of close my thoughts. Sarah, did you have anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up? Um, I, I like, I, I echo that sentiment. I hope none of you ever works for exposure ever again. Um, I hope that if you're told you can't negotiate, you realize that itself is a point of negotiation and negotiable. Um, read the fine print. Always know that, you know, like, if you don't feel comfortable with something in a co contract, cross it out before you sign it. See what happens, you know. Um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, I do it at the doctor's office, you know. <laughs> like, I'll be like, no, I'm not willing to have my information shared for, you know, research or marketing or, you know, think different things. Like, you know, if you see something that you don't like, cross it out and, and tell them, like, hey, I feel squidgy about this, not interested in that, you know, let's talk about it. I need a week. I'd like to consult with someone. Um, I guess, you know, if I'm going to leave you with something like that's the magic words, always ask for some time to review the contract. If they refuse, that's sketchy and um, a, a, a warning sign. Mm -hmm. I just hope that everyone feels empowered and like that they actually are at a negotiating table. Regardless of what table it is, you're always in a position to negotiate. And um, I don't want anyone to feel like they are supplicants just because they really, really want to do the fellowship they're being offered or the work that they are being offered. So I, I wish everyone the best. And um, actually, I don't know if it's on the handout or if there's a chat. Since I'm on the phone, I can't really see if there's a way to do this. But um, I'm happy, Naeem, if you would, you could put my email up if anyone wants to um, call for our Three half hour consultation. <laughs> That's something that they're worried about. <laughs> yeah, I highly recommend it. You know what I'll do? I will go ahead and include it on the worksheet that I send out to folks. Um, okay. And, and, and do that along with, because there's also other like listings and resources and stuff. Um, and yeah, that's, that's where I'm going to kind of leave us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and for your participation and for your questions and um yeah be well fuck the police um and uh i'll see you on the flip side Ooh, bye. thank you bye thank you <laughs> thank you everyone thank you thank you <laughs> bye